Well, it's great to be here. Thanks for that welcome, Alison. And huge thank you to um, everyone that's been involved in this. It's been a, a wonderful work in progress, and it's just been tremendous to see the, the work of the copyright platform. You'll recall that the start of um, Creative Commons copyright platform was to create a space, a discussion space to strategize and copyright reform as a complement action to developing and stewarding the licenses. And so it's really good to just reflect on that for a moment about how we came to where we are today. The other point I wanted to make was that um, this copyright platform is really part of that first strategic goal of our strategy around advocacy. This is important to ensure we shape and mold the copyright system to advance our goals and really truly realize our vision. So the third point I wanted to say and the last point is really how important the involvement of our community is in, in, in making policy. And I think that when you look at the quality of the of what we will hear today it is just really remarkable how um we have the involvement of our community central to policy making and the working groups are just such a great example of that key strategic theme of ours which is better sharing and really illustrating how important collaboration is within a dynamic community of copyright experts guided by this principle of sharing and doing things better, that better sharing principle, which is all in the public interest. So thank you for letting me uh, say a few words as we start today. I'm so looking forward to the presentations. Thank you to each and every one of you. And now I've got a hand over to Brigitte. Brigitte, are you ready to start? Yes, thank you so much, Catherine. Thanks for your welcoming words. It's an honor to have you um, kick us off and uh, providing this backdrop for our discussion today. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Brigitte Vizna. I'm the Director of Policy, Open Culture and Glam at Creative Commons, and I facilitate the uh, Creative Commons copyright platform. Uh, and at the beginning of this year, the, um, the copyright platform decided to respond to some of the emerging policy challenges that are affecting the open ecosystem. And to do that, we established together four working groups uh, to really try to probe these key policy issues from, from a global perspective. And uh, over the past few months, um, we have explored together the hot button topics of artificial intelligence and copyright, uh, platform liability, um, uh, copyright limitations and exceptions, and the ethics of open sharing. And so each working group was able to, uh, in record time, produce a, a paper. Uh, and all these uh, four working papers are now published and available on the Creative Commons Medium publication. Um, I'll share the link in the chat just now, but I encourage all of you to, to read them in full. Um, there's a lot of content in there that I'm sure will be of interest to you. Um, perhaps after this webinar, because now we're just about to hear from each of the working groups lead, uh, who will share the key highlights from, from, these, from these papers. Um, we also want to make sure to leave plenty of time for questions and discussions uh, towards the end of this webinar. So please feel free to ask in your, your questions in the chat or come on stage uh, towards the end when we'll open the Q&A session. So now I have the pleasure to quickly introduce our, our speakers uh, before I hand over the mic to, uh, to each of them. So first we have uh, leading working group one on artificial intelligence, uh, Mahmoud Warde, uh, who's a part-time lecturer in digital technologies at Lowborough University in, the, in London. And he's a longtime dedicated contributor to CC and one of several leaders uh, leading the commons in, in the United Kingdom. So welcome, Mahmoud. Then we'll have um, working group two's lead uh, dealing with platform liability. Uh, this is Emine Yildirim. She's a doctoral researcher at a prominent Belgian institution, and she's working at the intersection of freedom of expression and thought and technology. Thirdly, uh, working group three deals with exceptions and limitations and is led by uh, Andre Huang, uh, who's a researcher at the Internet Lab. It's a Brazilian independent research center on internet, on internet policy. 
Um, he's also currently pursuing a master's degree in law at the University of Sao Paulo, and he's an active member of the CC Brazil community. And last but not least, we have Josie Fraser. She's the lead of Working Group 4 on Ethics and Open Sharing. She's the head of digital policy at the National Lottery Heritage Fund in the UK. Uh, she's been a member of Creative Commons um, Global Network for years, and she's a longtime champion of the Commons. So thank you very much to all of you for all your work throughout this year. We're very excited to hear about the results of um, of each of the working groups. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mahmoud to guide us through the findings of your group first. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brigitte. Um, so just trying to get my screen sharing uh, running here. So, um, Here we go. Can you see the presentation now? So uh, welcome everybody and thank you Bridget, for that uh, introduction. Um, as Bridget mentioned, I'm going to be uh, presenting the um, work of the um, Creative Commons AI uh, working group. And um, our working group is exploring matters relating to copyright law and the use and generation of content by computer algorithms. And um, of course, Creative Commons has already had uh, published um, some of its positions on this in response to various national and international consultations. So we were very lucky in being able to build on this prior work. And I want to sort of thank everybody who'd actually put in um, quite a lot of effort in, on this topic prior to the working group uh, coming together. Um, however, of course, this is an area that's constantly changing in terms of the legislation, um, as well as, of course, the technology. And it's also a very wide ranging remit in terms of how much progress is happening with regard to the use and generation of content um, by computers. So to start with, we decided to divide our work and outputs into five areas, um, which are the definition of AI, text and data mining, AI and ML training, machine learning training, um, AI generations and creations, and last but not least, authors collaborating with AI. And there's, of course, much to be said on each of these topics alone. I think, I mean, each of these could probably be a working group in and of itself. Um, and so what follows, of course, is a summary of our position, and I'll provide details of where you can find more detail, uh, more sort of information on the work that we've been doing um, at the end of my presentation. So, of course, the best starting point for our work, we felt, was to explore the definition of AI. And we feel that clarity on the basic definition of AI of, um, is a prerequisite to really any kind of regulation in the copyright area. Um, and AI, of course, needs to be properly understood before any copyright implications um, can be truly uh, developed or addressed. And at the core of it, I think this could sort of summarize our position with this, is that um, we see that there is nothing today, or in our view, at least in the very in the relatively near future, which can reasonably, reasonably be construed to be artificial intelligence in the sense of what matters for copyright issues. Um, as uh, Jonathan, one of our working group members, has put it, you know, it's kind of the there is no there, there position in the sense that really, you know, that there is no... Um, there is no artificial intelligence. And I think this brings up, you know, um, an issue around the language that's being used. And as you can see in the position paper, as well as this presentation, sort of there's a lot of interchangeability between saying AI and algorithmically generated content. And, you know, that, that's part of, I think, the, the, you know, the fact that this is very much an area in development and where um, really uh, there is yet, there, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of, um, definitions and agreement as to exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about this topic. Um, and of course, it's not just in terms of sort of a le clear legal definition, there isn't really even a clear technical definition of AI um, as far as we can see. So, you know, of course, it is an evolving concept and it's an umbrella term that 
encompasses a lot of different algorithms and you know, it could be referring to machine learning, natural language processing, predictive models, neural networks, and many, many others. And essentially, um, we see that any algorithm that's capable of producing generative output or classifying data or making decisions that approximate the capabilities of humans tends to be lumped as AI. Um, but again, we feel that it's only AI until it becomes normalized. So what we think of as AI, or what we might have thought of as AI 10, um, 10 years ago, is really just another algorithm as far as we're concerned today um, um, in, in large part. Um, and we feel that if, you know, one of the dangers of sort of trying to pin it down to one specific technical definition of AI is that then that could actually, you know, engender um, an incentive to try and categorize all kinds of algorithms as AI in terms of adopting rules and measures um, that might relate to legislation. So, um, you know, all of this together means that we really feel very strongly that intervention, in, any intervention in copyright law is very premature and any kind of policy around this really needs to be carried out with extreme caution. Um, the next topic we uh, looked at was text and data mining. Now, of course, text and data mining activities are pivotal in supporting research and innovation, and as well as in the training of machine learning uh, systems and, and AI models, essentially. Um, but we feel that since TDM activities are non-consumptive and non-expressive users of work, um, we we don't see that they compete with original markets for work and could, he, could actually enhance them. And as such, it shouldn't be made subject to any um, additional authorizations. Um, as again, um, the, you know, as long as um, the use uh, and access, of, of course, is done, uh, is done in a legal way. Um, a very, another very important um, aspect that we feel in terms of um, making sure that TDM activities shouldn't be considered, um, uh, or rather, you know, uh, access, we should uh, encourage access to larger data sets in the context of text and data mining is in order to reduce bias, unfairness, and um, exclusion in the outputs of these algorithms. And we encourage the use of larger and more diverse data sets in, uh, in order to reduce this kind of bias. Um, and of course, this is where you know maybe we're overlapping slightly with the work of the um, exceptions and limitations working group. But um, you know we do feel that this can be achieved with exceptions and limitations, and it doesn't necessarily need to be something specific um, to um, any particular um, training model or anything specific to again machine learning or AI. Um, and of course, one of the key things with this topic is. Um, the issue of privacy and, and ethics. And we do feel, however, that, you know, just taking into account our position, we are very much aware that a balance needs to be uh, found between this push to include more data in order to reduce bias and fairness and, and exclusion um, on the one hand, and of course, protecting the privacy rights and ethical and human rights of the um, subjects of this, of this data. Um, another topic that we um, looked at in the context of this particular, um, in, in the context of text and data mining, is also DRM. And we take the position that there should be no digital rights management or technical protective measure, uh, measures to restrict um, otherwise legal access to data. Um, and of course, again, you know, the emphasis here is on the um, safeguarding the ethical requirements for transparency in the use of data. Um, but we feel that this is something that needs to be established outside of the boundaries of the copyright system. Um, the next topic we looked at, uh, the third topic is AI and machine learning training. And we see that the use of copyright works as input to train AI and machine learning. Uh, applications shouldn't necessarily be considered copyright infringement as a default, and it should be generally allowed under um, clear and open exceptions. Um, again, we feel that this um, use and access of data can improve and um, 
encourage innovation and development of algorithms in support of public interest activities. And that's the lens through which we're looking at this, uh, primarily in the context of, of this kind of um, um, position. And of course, you know, related to what we were talking about with text and data mining, it, we also feel that it helps reduce bias and enhance inclusion. That said, of course, we have to take into account um, other concerns when using material uh, to train um, AI and machine learning algorithms. We have to, uh, example, for example, consider the tension between the value of open data and the legitimate concerns about privacy and ethical and responsible use. Um, and in this, in the context, especially of uh, openly Creative Commons licensed content used to train AI applications, um, you know, Creative Commons has already determined that there's no special or explicit permission regarding new technologies that's required from the licensor, and there is actually the, or there's already some uh, published uh, information on the Creative Commons website around the. Um, use of content in use of CC license content in, in training AI applications. Um, and generally speaking, it's just that CC licenses do not restrict the reuse, of course, and at the moment we're not, you know, we're not looking at um, uh, any sort of additions to the uh, previous very well expressed positions of CC in, uh, in this regard. Um, and Speaking of copyright protected data generally, whether it's they're released under an open license or not, um, and again, assuming that the access to the work is legitimate and legal, um, the use of um, AI should be considered non-infringing by default. Um, and the last but not least, we looked, we looked also at AI generations and uh, Creations. Oh, sorry. Actually, no. This is not the last topic. The last but one topic. We looked at AI generations and creations, and um, we feel that copyright and related minutes. rights are unwarranted for AI-generated outputs um, or algorithmically generated outputs, as AI is currently understood for two fundamental reasons: the lack of human author and the lack of um, originality. Of course, the notion of human authorship is a bedrock principle of copyright, and um, we feel that direct human involvement should remain a precondition to determining whether a work is worthy of protection. Um, and also, obviously, most um, AI algorithms, or in, in most cases, AI algorithms are automated and mathematical means to encode statistical information about a set of input. And as such, um, we feel that there is a uh, presumed lack of originality in the context of anything produced by these algorithms. So, in short, we feel that algorithmically uh, generated outputs should be in the public domain, at least pending a clear understanding of this uh, evolving technology and clarity on uh, what specific criteria a computer system really should meet before such a system should ever be considered an author with rights. And yes, now last but not least, we've got authors collaborating with AI. And with regard to this topic, really, I think this is a very much, um, you know, a, a, a one in which there's a lot of clarity yet to be sought. Um, and, you know, we are clear on our position, as I just detailed in the previous topic, that machine generated outputs should be in the public domain. However, when it comes to this topic, um, the consideration related to the extent of algorithmic input into the into human into the work of human authors um, does require um, quite a bit more clarity um, in terms of understanding what the legal implications are in the context of copyright. And uh, one of the you know one of the um, areas that we've been looking at is looking at certain sort of examples of where this comes into play and we've uh, we explored for example distributed autonomous organizations uh, which rely on um, the blockchain to sort of um, enable governance of certain networks of people um, and identified for example this this uh, website that's linked to here and in the position paper which actually um, uses a, a, a DAO basically as a, as a, as a, a governance structure to govern the output of um, uh, a, a machine learning algorithm 
and uh, sells these as NFTs. And of course, again, uh, Creative Commons has already um, explored its position uh, tentatively, at least for now, with regard to NFTs. But again, this is very much a, an evolving uh, space that we hope to be able to look into in more detail. And I just wanted to mention very quickly here with GitHub, for example, uh, Copilot, which came out uh, very recently, even though it's not specifically related to um, Creative Commons licenses, that it has led to a lot of exploration in this area of um, authors using the app of AI in their own output and um, been subject of uh, a lot of um, exploration in the context of especially open source licenses. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from these projects. Um, and just to end off with, I wanted to um, say that what we've done, again, as you know, th these are, as I said, very wide ranging topics and we're hoping that the work um, that has started with this uh, bringing together this working group and publishing this position paper will continue. Um, and we set up basically at this web address um, a, uh, a microsite where we've um, provided a lot of information, a lot of background information, including a lot of resources on everything that has been published uh, by CC on this topic um, in the past. So hopefully it'll act as a resource for anybody who's interested in contributing to this project uh, or to this working group and continuing the work of the working group. So I'd encourage you to please visit this, explore the content in more detail, and please reach out to us via the Slack channel um, as well um, if you have any thoughts, ideas, and if you wish to um, continue to contribute to the work that we're doing here. And finally, of course, I just wanted to say a big thank you to, uh, to Creative Commons um, and the copyright policy team for all of the work they've done in putting together these work, working groups. I think it's a great uh, initiative um, that I hope we'll find ways of, of uh, building on and continuing. And of course, all of the contributors, again, if you visit the um, site I linked to on the previous slide, you can see a full list of all of the um, people who very generously contributed their time to the work of this working group as well. Thank you so much, Mahmoud. Um, I'm sure you can also share the links in the chat. So if people want to uh, follow up and continue this conversation, they will know where to go. Um, but I'd like to swiftly move on to Emine, who is now going to present the work of Working Group 2 on platform liability. Over to you, Emine. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, let me share my screen. Um... All right, uh, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. As mentioned, I'm the lead of the working group on platform liability. Uh, our working group was established uh, along with other three working groups uh, because sharing or using content with open licenses such as CC license uh, content is predominantly dependent on the availability of online platforms. Uh, therefore, we aim to identify emerging trends concerning platform liabilities in different regions in the world to assess their impact on freedom to share. And with that goal in mind, and thanks to our diverse member pool in the working group, we were able to cover a wide range of countries. And eventually our end product was a policy position paper as mentioned, uh, that has been published as a blog post on the CC uh, Medium channel recently. And it's a, the title of our position paper, as you can also see from the screen, is Freedom to Share, How the Law of Platform Liability Impacts Licensors and Users. Um, this turned out to be a great piece of work, to be honest. And on that note, uh, before I even beginning, I would like to thank, uh, thank a million times to our working group members for their efforts and time in drafting our position paper. Uh, today, I'll just give you a snapshot of what uh, we did, uh, but I would still strongly recommend you to check out our blog post version as well. Um, so let me, okay. Uh, to begin, uh, first, I would like to start, start with our scope uh, to clarify uh, our geographic, geographic scope for the position paper was uh, the following countries or regions. 
uh, first European Union, then United States, then Canada, then Latin America. This includes countries like Chile, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, Mexico, Brazil, and Peru. And lastly, uh, we uh, covered New Zealand. And in terms of fundamental rights, we wanted to focus on, uh, we uh, generally wanted to emphasize the impact of platform liability uh, regions on, on the rights like freedom of opinion and expression, access to information, right to participate in cultural life, and lastly, freedom to share. Uh, you might not be very familiar with the concept of freedom to share uh, because this is not an explicitly stated, stated fundamental right in international human rights law, but it finds its tangible expression in the rights uh, of freedom of expression and access to information, cultural heritage and knowledge. And with that being said, uh, I would like to get into details of our mapping, but due to time constraints, I uh, would like to share the current trends and commonalities we identified during our mapping. Uh, first, uh, we have seen that um, European Union's Copyright uh, in Digital Single Market Directive and United States uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act have, have a major influence on the platform uh, copyright liability, reg liability regulations of other countries. And some countries actually have yet to adopt or amend uh, their legislation on platform copyright liability. But a major concern is that they could import foreign models on platform liability, such as uh, the before mentioned uh, CDSM and the MCA. And also some countries are adopting notice and takedown regimes, often under the pressure from the US, while others go even further to adopt notice and stay down regimes. Uh, we also uh, witnessed that automatic content recognition tools are becoming the choice of enforcement by platforms to comply with lawmakers' requests around the world. And we also seen that exemplary review of user, user supplied content, including human review, does not appear to distinguish prima facie infringement cases from lawful users. And both notice and step down uh, and notice and takedown regimes can be abused by malicious actors through bad faith notices. And unfortunately, uh, we also seen that some governments uh, seek to strip intermediaries off of their immunities uh, by. Um, sorry, just a second. Uh, by recalibrating the knowledge uh, standard for infringement and or imposing injunctions on intermediaries disregarding the safeguards provided in their legislation already. And uh, regarding the open community, we, we saw that many laws fail to account for openly licensed content, such as CC licensed works and possible user safeguards that might protect open uh, sharing. Also open licensed works and works accessed under copyright exceptions and limitations have been erroneously identified as infringing resulting in unjustified takedowns and the overfiltering of lawful users. And we, we also witnessed that regimes that provide uh, for restriction of removed works uh, based on a system of notifications and counter notifications are often insufficient uh, to safeguard against erroneous or malicious takedowns and use of counter notifications uh, is rare and may be especially difficult for users engaged in lawful remix of open licensed works as they may not be able to communicate directly uh, with the copyright owner to definitely establish, establish the lawfulness of their use. And lastly, um, we uh, identified that requirements such as compulsory remuneration through collective licensing disregard open licenses and uses done under an exception such as fair use. And after we identified the current trends, uh, we came up with five uh, main uh, policy recommendations. And these uh, recommendations, of course, are not exhaustive. I'm sure there will be many more recommendations coming from different uh, policy position papers. But we believe uh, these uh, five recommendations are a great start to trigger a discussion on uh, internet platform liability issues. 
So if I were to share the first recommendation, uh, freedom to share should not be constrained by policies or incentives that prompt internet platforms to preemptively filter, block, or monitor con content without human review. So what we mean here is um, we believe that laws that create such obligations or incentives to block or uh, filter content restrict unauthorized but lawful uses of copyrighted works, use, uses authorized by open licenses, as well as use of works in the public domain. Therefore, in order to prevent uh, freedom to share from be being unduly impaired, ex ante and exposed human review should always be ensured before a use of content is deemed infringing. When it comes to the second recommendation, uh, we, uh, we suggest that freedom to share should not be constrained by policies voluntarily adopted by platforms that preemptively filter, block, or monitor content without human review. Uh, what we mean here, as you may know, sometimes platforms also adopt uh, their own content policies voluntarily and automated content recognition tools, in other words, upload filters, without any legal mandate coming from governments. However, today's filtering technologies also come with their limitations. They are not able to detect the context, purpose, or nuance, which characterizes the use of a content. Therefore, human review should also be ensured when platforms voluntarily adopt such content policies in order to preserve freedom to share in the online world. And when it comes to the third recommendation, uh, we uh, suggest that freedom to share should be enforceable ex ante through mechanisms for identifying content used on the basis of an exception, limitation, or license. And what we mean here, as mentioned, uh, current filtering technologies are not capable of detecting the context or purpose of use. Additionally, platforms generally do not implement protocols uh, to pre prior check uh, before blocking if matching content is in public domain or licensed under a non-exclusive license, such as a CC license. In those situations and in all, all erroneous uh, blockings, ex ante safeguards should be ensured to platform users by design, while ex ante blo blocking should only be conducted in exceptional cases of flagrant infringement. And moving on to the fourth recommendation, uh, freedom to share uh, should be protected by easy and rapid procedures for a reinstatement of content removed on the basis of alleged infringement, included in cases where the content is used on the basis of an exception, limitation, or license. And as preemptive blocking or filtering are subjected to uh, errors and false claims, uh, as we mentioned before, regimes governing platforms should also require platforms to establish clear and simple procedures to users whose content has been blocked or removed. In other words, users should be able to assert that their uploading of the content is lawful, so they should have the right to contest or challenge uh, such a decision on remo removal or blocking. Lastly, uh, we, suggest, we suggest that freedom to share should be enforced with remedies for the unreasonable and erroneous removal of content on the basis of alleged infringement and for bad faith claims of copyright infringement. And uh, what we mean here is that regimes governing uh, internet platforms uh, should discourage the erroneous removal of content as well as bad faith uh, claims of copyright infringement by providing remedies to users who have been harmed by such uh, errors and false claims. That actually uh, wraps up uh, our uh, discussion regarding our position paper, uh, but um, I would like to add one more thing before we move on to the next speaker. Uh, with our working group, we are interested in turning our uh, working group into more of an informal working group where we can have uh, by monthly meetings to discuss uh, current hot uh, policy issues on internet platform liability. And we are really keen on uh, having uh, more members from uh, different uh, countries, uh, different regions in the world to expand uh, our work uh, and be more inclusive with our work. So if you would be interested, uh, please uh, feel free to send me an email. You can uh, find my email address on the screen. And I would like to thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. And I would like to uh, thank Bridget, Catherine and Alison here as well.
Thank you so much, Emine. Um, and thank you to both of you actually for doing so well with keeping the time. We're right on the schedule. Um, so Emine, again, if you would like to share some, some links in the chat, I think people will appreciate that. It was really fantastic to hear about your, your groundbreaking recommendations. I think that, um, that there's been a lot of thought put into those. So thank you again for all your hard work. I know that some people are trying to uh, ask questions now, but we'll, we'll keep them all for the end of the session once e every speaker has presented. Um, so next, I would like to call on André Wang to present the work of Working Group 3 on exceptions and limitations. Over to you, André. Hello, everyone. Uh... My name is Andrea Wong. I am the lead for I led the activities of the working group on exceptions and limitations, which we decided to rename as working group on user rights later on. First of all, I would like to thank you, thank everyone who contributed to the position paper. This paper was written by many hands and by many members of the working group, but also by people within the CC corporate platform who contributed with comments and as well as members of other organizations. I would like to thank you all. Uh, as our working group uh, started to think on exceptions and limitations and what, what should be our position on this matter, we decided to envision our position paper in terms of the objectives copyright should have, what are the problems in current copyright law and how those issues can and should be fixed. And one of the first problems we identified uh, concerned the terminology and the name of the working group itself, uh, exceptions and limitations. Uh, this terminology of exceptions and limitations is of course the most traditional one in copyright law, but we understand that uses that foster freedom of expression and information, uh, as well as uses that foster societal and cultural goals, such as education and research, public interest activities by libraries, museums, galleries, and archives, as well as uses that benefit people with disabilities, are in themselves an integral part of copyright and should, protect, should be protected as rights. Uh, diseases are not uh, simply exceptions and limitations to copyright, but rather are in an integral part of the copyright system itself and should be understood as such. Uh, the working group, therefore, uh, chose to abandon the phrasing exceptions and limitations and instead adopt the expression user rights, which is in itself a position of our part on how copyright law should be approached. Uh, we understand that when you use uh, user rights instead of exceptions and limitations, we are saying that copyright law should not only protect the interests of authors and rights holders, but also protect public interest and promote the access to knowledge, culture, and information. Uh, another guiding idea for our position paper was that we wanted to have a time during position paper and which could encompass different jurisdictions as well as be useful for both uh, at both at the national and international level we wanted to have a position paper which would be able to hold up for many years uh, so, uh, because writing such a position paper is a considerable effort it took all of the working groups a few months to write their position papers, but also because copyright law is going through some important changes in different parts of the world. We understood that if you wanted this paper to be useful for the coming years, we should avoid making explicit references to current events, which could make our position paper to become soon outdated. Uh, we also didn't want to tie our position paper to any specific jurisdiction. Uh, current copyright law is composed of multiple national laws, international treaties, bilateral agreements, 
European directive, ex directives, etc. And understood that making reference to specific legislation could make our position paper uh, less appealing to activists and to organizations in other jurisdictions. So we decided to avoid focusing on issues specific to the US copyright law or to the European copyright law, uh, for example, and instead adopt a broader view, which we understood could make our paper have a broader reach and be useful to different organizations uh, across the globe. Uh, in that sense, we also decided to mention possible paths forward concerning user rights, both at the national and international level. Uh, and I just think it's important to mention also that we had some limits. We can consider the deadline, uh, the size of the position paper, and the language. We also decided to adopt a language that wouldn't be uh, overly academic, so it could be read by people with different backgrounds and could be understood and used by organizations and activists who are not necessarily uh, experts in copyright law. So given these uh, these guiding principles of our position paper uh, and what thought it should look like, uh, and that we wanted to approach uh, what should be what the goals, issues, and solutions of copyright law were, are, and should be, uh, and how to fix these issues. We set out to write our recommendations. As I already mentioned, we decided early on to use the expression "user rights" rather than exceptions and limitations, as we understand that the goal of copyright law should really be broader in the sense that it should not only protect the interests, the interests of rights holders and of authors, but also it should also fo uh, foster the public interest and promote access to knowledge, culture, and information. So in the introduction, we briefly explained the adoption of this terminology in line with what we understand should be the goals of copyright law and copyright law itself. Uh, we then, in our work, we then list, started to list what we identified were the issues in copyright law concerning user rights. Uh, each member of the working group then uh, wrote a few paragraphs on the subject, stating what problems revolve around each of these subjects, and we discussed the proposals of each of the working group members inside the working group. Uh, so. This is overall how it works, but these are the, the issues, the specific issues we came up with and which are part of our position paper. Uh, these are, I think these are not important sentences, are not exhaustive uh, issues for user rights. We acknowledge in our conclusion that it is part of the duty of, of activists is always to envision new user rights, which can and should protect uh, the public interest and access to knowledge, information, and culture. So the first of the, uh, the topics we approach in our position paper is that copyright law should be flexible uh, to allow the protection and enforcement of user rights promote the realization of fundamental rights. We then say that copyright law should protect users that serve freedom of expression and information Copyright laws should protect educational users. It should also protect research users, it should protect the activities of labs, and it should protect the users by persons with disabilities, as well as cross-border users. And copyright law, should, copyright law should also prevent contractual overrides of user rights, as well as technological overrides of user rights. Uh, I, this, I selected a few sentences of each of these topics. Uh, the, I, I can't, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have the time to go in depth uh, in each of the topics, but I selected a few sentences which highlights the idea behind each of these issues, each of these topics. Each of the topics we try to follow a similar, uh, a similar approach in that we say what are the goals behind this topic, 
what are the problems concerning this topic and what solutions we imagine could solve these problems. Uh, so this is a brief sentence for um, the first topic concerning the enforcement of user rights to promote the realization of fundamental rights, which states that permitted users shall not be interpreted narrowly, but rather according to their objectives and purposes on a case-by-case -case basis and in such a manner as to give effect to their underlying aims. In this first part of the position paper, we also present the idea of technological neutrality, which comes up, comes up uh, again later on in different parts of the position paper. Then we, we say that concerning the freedom of expression and information, uh, something that we held very deep in our position paper and as we wrote it, is that copyright law has also to be understood uh, as part of the broader legal system in the, in the sense of the protection of fundamental rights. So you acknowledge that the user rights are a uh, limitation inside the copyright system, but that the exclusive rights of rights holders should also be limited by fundamental rights and courts should interpret uh, copyright law within this uh, within this with, with this scope and with this view of fundamental rights uh, besides and beyond the copyright system itself. We go on to talk about how copyright law should protect educational users both in a digital and in and, and in analog environment environment, which is in line with our idea of technological neutrality, and also research users. Uh, both in the educational users and research users, uh, as well as in the lens, which you, is the next slide, uh, we, we don't mention specifically the pandemic, but we of course had the pandemic in mind. When we speak about control digital learning and the possibility of, pro of educational institutions uh, performing their activities online, we of course had in mind the, the challenges of such organizations amidst the pandemic, but we really didn't want to, to specify the pandemic uh, in our position paper, but of course we had this in mind when we wrote it. We go on to talk about people, persons with disabilities, and we mentioned the Mahakash Treaty, but we also mentioned that we should be, okay, exceptions and limitations or rather user rights should be broader in the sense that should, should ensure equal access to cultural works for people with disabilities and promote inclusivity, inclusivity not only to visually impaired but also to broader definition of persons with disabilities. And Andre, and cross, two minutes, sorry. okay? Two minutes? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we're going to talk about cross-border users uh, which is something we we talk about considering international treaties as well. Uh, and finally, we talk about contractual overrides and TPNs that if we do not prevent contractual overrides and TPNs, they could uh, limit the exercise of user rights. Uh, finally, the conclusion, uh, we really press forward on the need for changes in copyright law both at the national and international level, uh, we make recommendations for the how national congresses, parliaments should uh, reform copyright law, but also present the idea that international approach is also necessary to ensure user rights. Finally, as I also already mentioned, we say that it is not an exhaustive list. These eight uh, topics we approach are not the only topics that should be that concern user rights, and we should always envision new user rights as we come across other problems concerning access to knowledge, information, and exercise of fundamental rights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andre. I thought that was a very comprehensive overview of the many topics that arise in the context of exceptions and limitations. And as you point out, um, that's not even everything. So there is still quite some work to do in that field. 
So thank you very much. And now I'd like to hand over to Josie for your presentation on the working group on the ethics of open sharing. Over to you. Thanks so much. Um, I am just going to get my screen up and then hopefully it's presenting. Sorry, I can't see the screen. Please just yell out if everything's good. We can see the last slide. Or ah, OK, it's showing the first slide. Oh, All OK, right. no. All right, then that's fine. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, uh, hopefully we're going to take this short, brief, pleasant journey together. So thank you, everybody, to for coming along today. First of all, um, I'm speaking on behalf of the working group four, and we were tasked with looking at beyond copyright, the ethics of open sharing. You'll forgive my somewhat straightforward presentation style today. Um, it it reflects very well, I think, the um, approach that we took to the piece of work in general. We started this piece of work at the end of July and we finished at the beginning of November. So it was an iterative race through a huge amount of issues, um, which we really narrowed down to focus on well, what can we as a group produce during this uh, amount of time that will be really useful to others working in a similar area. So we really focused on what we can produce that can be of practical use and takeaway. Obviously, in this in this um, short presentation, I'm going to lose a lot of the nuance. I'm going to lose a lot of the great references that have gone into the paper. Medium assures me that it's a 12 minute read. So please do go and explore the paper in full because there's there's a lot in there. But what we'll cover today is the skeleton. OK, so. Uh, we, we, we had some very thorny issues to tackle, namely, what do we mean by ethics and what do we mean by open sharing? And the um, definitions that we're using are working definitions. They're not supposed to uh, represent these terms in, in holistically. They're not supposed to be fit for every single situation. But the, for, for the purposes of this paper, we're looking at ethics primarily in relation to principles of equality, diversity and inclusion, although we're recognising that those principles and the application of those principles are not themselves universal either. Um, but what we're trying to get at is fundamentally, do things cause damage, harm, or do they promote opportunity, bring benefit, or sometimes do they do both? So we're in that space in terms of ethic, in, in terms of ethics. In terms of open sharing, we're specifically looking at the process of sharing digital materials under an open license or by applying the public domain tool. Um, so we are not looking at the ethics of copyright frameworks in general. We're not looking at the specifics of different types of open licenses. Those uh, issues are both extremely important areas, but not ones that we're able to tackle um, within this within this project. In terms of our audience then, this paper is really designed for anybody who is creating and sharing digital materials of any kind. And that's whether you already are openly sharing these materials or whether you, you've not taken your organisation into that space or not. So the crux of the um, position paper and the crux of the arguments that we're making is, first of all, that the decision to share openly or not is itself an ethical decision. And by that we mean, yes, many decisions in life are ethical decisions. Most things have an ethical aspect to them. However, typically that decision is not being considered in terms of the benefits, risks and harms that it might cause. And what we're saying is that it's really, really important for organisations to consider that, especially given that most organisations have a commitment to social good now and they have uh, policies around equity, diversity and inclusion um, and they have aims and, and they're, they're trying to do work in that area. So what we're saying is actually this folds into the wider work of your organisation and the wider strategic approach that your organisation should be making. Our next point is that for the vast majority of time, open sharing is actually a very positive choice that can extend those uh, social benefits and, and, and that kind of reach. And we give in the paper a range of areas where this is, um, where this is evidenced uh, and demonstrated. 
uh, rebalancing the historic record, for example, the work that women in red are doing and the work that art and feminism are doing to fix gaps in the historical record and make sure that um, activities and achievements by people are actually included in the historical record um, is, is, a, is a great example of one of the kind of ethical approaches to sharing openly. We give a lot of examples around healthcare and obviously during the coronavirus pandemic, there's been a huge amount of activity that's been possible because of open sharing and um, collaborative work, addressing misinformation. Um, education has got a long history of benefiting and understanding the benefits of open licensing um, and language and cultural heritage is another area that, it, that, that there's some very clear cultural um, and, and global benefits emerging. So for example the Nigerian language or history document project at the moment and the Balinese language wiki source project are both examples of areas where um, by opening Work, by sharing work openly, um, the projects are able to include, develop, capture and um, promote uh, different, different languages. Um, and also there's quite a lot of work that's gone on in this space in terms of government and publicly funded organisations and quite a good knowledge base in terms of why, why it's good to open things up. So that brings us to the third point, which is actually not sharing openly, so making the decision on behalf of your organisation to not openly license goods actually might limit the positive social impact that your organisation is able to make. However, not everything should be shared openly. Again, with our ethical lens on, and, and we're, we're particularly looking at uh, sharing things under open licence or um, by putting them into the public domain, not just in terms of sharing. There's a whole other layer of issues around that, which we touch upon in the paper. But specific to open sharing and open licensing um, work are a few things. One, openly licensing and providing those upfront permissions provides a fantastic global reach. It, it extends the opportunity for impact. So that's an area that needs to be taken into account. The other area that needs to be considered is that the fact that um, open licenses are irrevocable and perpetual. And by that we mean as long as the conditions of the license are adhered to, the person that placed that cannot withdraw those, those permissions. And as long as those are adhered to, those permissions will stand for the life of the copyright. So those are the kind of the key areas that we need to consider when we're thinking about an ethical review of choosing to share openly or not. And the three areas that we've um, recognised within that, that we've identified, and you know, I think there are many more than this, and also I think the ones that we've um, identified are kind of really um, at the, at the wide end of the scale are around cultural appropriation. So that's the kind of misappropriation of um, cultural um, assets, um, using things without permission, using things insensitively or disrespectfully um, is a whole area that um, needs to be acknowledged and worked through. And we give some tips for how that might be um, taken forward by organisations in the, in the document. The other issues are, um, are the issue of meaningful consent. So it's really important when you're considering the length of time that you're providing that uh, permission for that you are gaining meaningful consent. And by that, um, we, we give a couple of examples. So one example is children and young people who legally are not allowed to give meaningful consent in many countries. Uh, so there's something very important to navigate there in terms of uh, the ethics of consent to do something that may be impacting somebody for a very, very long time for the, in their lives. Um, the other example that we give in terms of that is historic consent. So that's consent that was given prior to the kind of technological developments that we all benefit from today. So consent that was given without kind of thinking that, oh, well, these things will be able to be easily found by a search engine from anywhere in the world and and, and used. So meaningful consent is a really important consideration. And then the third um, area is withdrawal of consent. So unless you can take back your consent, uh, it, you know, it's it's not really 
consent. So you should have that option, particularly in relation to sensitive uh, personal materials and, and testimonies. You should be allowed to withdraw consent. And um, in Europe, the right to withdraw consent to information is enshrined in GDPR. Um, but actually, it's not just a legal issue, it's an ethical issue. So um, I think one the other consideration is a careful thought of, well, if that person does withdraw consent, what are the implications of that in terms of the licensing types? Um, in terms of the paper, we also provide practical steps for organisations to work through to look at moving towards ethical open practice. Uh, and this is about policies, the, the development of policies and positions, the scope and space for challenge to those policies um, and processes around exceptions. Um, also, um, making sure that the licenses and tools are actually robust and that you're not actually signing up to use something that, that isn't robust. So, you know, the, people can have a lot of confidence in the Creative Commons. Uh, suite of licenses and tools. Other newer um, licenses and tools may not be so well tested or so legally robust. Again, we talk about consent and we talk about keeping those openly licensed materials uh, in circulation. We covered quite a lot, but there were areas that we identified that we weren't able to cover, but actually very strongly connect to this area and um, would be really interesting to pursue. Um, so these particularly around um, looking at the growing, um, th there is a, a growing body of work attached to different areas, particularly work around um, indigenous populations um, and, and uh, other, other activist areas. Um, we didn't have time to put in a properly curated reading list here. And, but there are some amazing resources around and um, that does deter, deserve some more time and attention to share those works and promote those works. Um, policies and processes, examples and recipes. So lots of organisations are obviously looking how to implement their open licensing policies. And while they're doing that or while they're already doing that, um, they'll want to cover things like, well, how do I select those defaults for open sharing and how do I review exceptions and what's my process in place for, for managing those uh, areas where I see it's not actually a good idea to openly license these things. We also talked about ad the identification of credible licenses and alternatives for different kinds of materials. Um, so there was a call for uh, lists around that um, or, or kind of tests or um, comparisons um, and also recommendations for license types so for example we recognize the quite robust ongoing debate around cc by and cc by sa um, in terms of uh, you know which is the most appropriate for the organization and for the uh, materials that are being licensed and we think that there needs to be a significant more uh, work put into making that conversation more public um, and, and kind of capturing the arguments that are going on within the community, within the open communities for the benefit of everyone. And that's where I'll finish. I'll just obviously share my huge, huge thanks to everybody within the working group. We also were able to have a small period where the, um, where the, where the, um, review process was open to the general public. Uh, it was only for two weeks, but in that time, a huge number of people did really generously contribute to the work and make the paper um, for, make the paper as good as it is now, which it certainly wouldn't have been without their help. So that's it from me. Um, that was fantastic. It was very pacey. It's very pacey. So I hope, I, <laughs> I hope people kept up with me. I'm sure, I'm sure it was very clear. And if there's anything that anyone would like to delve into more deeply, um, now would be the time. But first, um, I would like to invite all the participants to join me in a, a virtual round of applause <laughs> for all the um, <laughs> for all the working groups. Um, 
it's really been um, an enormous amount of work that has gone into writing, preparing those papers, holding meetings. I'm not sure it all transpires in these um, succinct presentations, but um, it's been many months in the making. So I'm absolutely uh, thrilled and uh, so grateful to the, the working group leads and all the members, of course. And as we can see in the chat, I think we um, it's a shared sentiment. So from me um, and from everyone at Creative Commons, thank you very much for all the work that you've done. Um, it's it's really an honor to to be able to uh, have your contributions shared today. Um, so now I'd like to also I wanted to mention that Josie, you joined us at mid course. So all the work that you did in your group is all the more so commendable. So thank you very much for joining us um, mid, mid oh sorry midway through. Um, so now I would like to open up for a discussion. Uh, now's the time to ask all the burning questions that you've been holding on to. Um, you can either share them in the chat, as some of you have done already, and I'll, I'll, I'll take these in a minute. But you can also choose to come on stage and ask your question live, and Alison will uh, just explain quickly how that works. Sure, thanks, Brigitte. Uh, we do want to keep this as interactive as possible, and the working group leads are ready to chat with you. So if you have a question that you're comfortable asking on audio and video, there's a button in the top right corner that says request to share audio and video, and you'll pop up in my moderation panel. I'll get you up on the stage so you can have a chat. You are, as Brigitte said, you're welcome to type your questions. She's been keeping track of those, and she's going to moderate. But if you feel chatty and you want to come up uh, on audio and video, then please, please do that. So I would like to first take a question that was asked by Jennifer Zerke, um, because I think it applies to all the working groups. And her question is, um, well, do the user rights working group have plans to continue or more, move forward with their work? So Andre, um, you, you could take it first, but I think that we can clarify for all the working groups, what are your plans um, after this webinar, moving forward, how you intend on continuing your work. So, Andre, would you like to answer first? Thank you, Brigitte, and thank you, Jennifer, for the question. Uh, we did not discuss, discuss this possibility within the user rights uh, working group. I think in part because we were so focused on the position paper itself that we did not think very much beyond the position paper. But I think it's a very good uh, idea to have uh, periodical meetings, as I mean, uh, and the working group on intermediary liability will have, because this is an ongoing issue. And as I mentioned, there are so many efforts in copyright reform in many countries that I think uh, it can be very important to reach out to the network of Creative Commons Network and to other activists and organizations and have a uh, bi monthly or every four or three months, I don't know, meeting. I, it's something that I can talk with the working group and I will get back to you if I have a definitive answer. Anyone else? I'm happy to answer. Um, so uh, again, we, similar to Andre's situation, we galloped through our process. So that was really, we were keeping the eyes on the prize of getting the paper done. However, most of the people that contributed to the to the working paper, um, both within the group and from with outside of the group, are really committed to this area and are working in it or their day to day jobs involve this this kind of area. So um, people will continue working in this area, regardless of this scope. Hopefully this is you know what this has done is brought us together as a group um, and helped us really focus. Uh, on some specific issues collectively and and as you as I said at the end of my presentation we've identified several really great areas that would be brilliant for further projects or conference topics or activities and events and um, we'd be very interested I think to partner with organizations that would like to take um, charge of one of those areas and work with us to take them forward or with it with the group to take them forward but we're going to have a kind of a uh, pre festive period celebratory meetup where we'll we'll talk a little bit more about how we're going to go forward. Uh, 
Um, I'm happy to go next. And um, again, I, you know, I um, sort of uh, similar sentiments to, to what Andre and, and Josie had said, which is that uh, I think this is a topic, obviously, that will continue um, to be uh, an important one for us to look at in terms of um, both the use of um, Creative Commons license content and openly licensed content in uh, machine learning algorithms and other kinds of algorithms, as well as, of course, the issue of copyright around um, machine generated content as well. So I think these these two areas are ones in which, of course, I think there's going to be a lot more work to do. And uh, one of the uh, sort of one of the intentions behind this sort of platform, this um, pub pub platform that uh, where we published um, both kind of it partly was to gain a bit of transparency into sort of just the scope and complexity of what goes into looking at each of these topics that we identified, um, but also to act as a resource to um, for other people to be able to use. So, you know, of course, we, you know, we there there has been, for example, some publications around um, in, in in the UK, the EU, and organisations like WIPO where we've contributed. But I'd really like to see a more international sort of contribution where it becomes a resource where if there are any consultations, um, where any members of the community from around the world need to see what's gone before, if you like, and to build on that and to become this kind of central resource where we can share this information um, as a working group. That's really how I'd like to see this evolve as well. So, um, and, you know, of course, you know, it, to a large extent depends on the community's appetite for this. You know, it, it is, um, it, it is time, you know, it, it does require people's um, you know, contribution of time and, and, uh, and effort. So um, it has to be balanced, obviously, with, with people's uh, other commitments, but I, I'd really like to see it continue in one way or, or, or the other. Okay, um, I can go next. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, we would like to continue, but in an informal setting. Uh, so, what uh, we think is like we can still have discussions uh, on platform libraries issues around the world, and we want to be more inclusive because. Even though we have members from different countries, we still don't have members from, for example, Australia, mostly Asia and most African countries. So we are we were not able to uh, cover uh, issues on, in these countries. So it would be very interesting to have uh, people from those countries as well. And I know that uh, platform liability issues will never be over in a day. So I think uh, it's a good idea to keep going, but as I said, in a more informal setting, but I think we should still discuss with the other members and with the new members to see what we could do in the future. Thank you so much. Um, what we'll do is we'll also publish a blog post uh, to recap this, this webinar, and we'll give you um, information on how to, to join any of these working groups. Um, and I'll share information in the chat on how you can join the copyright platform and our mailing list. So you will know when we have our monthly meetings and, and it'll be easier to, to follow up. Um, so there were lots of interesting questions. Um, the next one I have on my list was actually from, from Josie. Um, where you uh, were wondering how, uh, and that was a question I think for Emine, uh, how to how the requirements for human review would be implemented given the scale of content shared across social platforms. Is that something that your group touched on, Emine? Um, so that's a great question and a very challenging question because uh, you are right, but what uh, we were thinking also uh, in my personal opinion is uh, we believe uh, we can use, still use uh, content recognition tools but in a, in the sense that maybe only man manifestly infringing content as the ec said um, could be uh, blocked uh, ex ante but for other content maybe there could be something like semi-automated recognition tools so uh, there is a human in the loop in any case, uh, but when there is a content uh, that is a match, uh, the content uh, can be, uh, that content can be forward, uh, forward to a human and there should be a rapid ex ante human review before blocking or disabling access to content basically. So I know it's challenging, but in, 
if we do not have human in the loop, then we will also uh, infringe on human uh, rights. So that's uh, what we discuss, but this is still a PhD topic. I think like it takes uh, years of research to actually answer. Yeah. That was a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, many of us are asking ourselves this and um, we'll, we'll have to be patient and wait for you to be done with your research, Amina. <laughs> um, there's another question coming from Lee, Lee Dodds, uh, and that was for Andre. I think he was interested in uh, the user rights recommendation um, and he pointed out the there doesn't seem, they don't seem to touch on the rights of indigenous peoples uh, as an, uh, another important group whose needs might need to be protected by copyright. Um, is this something that your group has considered? Uh, thank you, Lee. It's a great question. Uh, we did not uh, touch uh, on indigenous populations, not explicitly at least, but we do mention fundamental rights and I think we certainly need more and more protection to indigenous populations concerning copyright law and also intellectual property law in general. When you talk about traditional knowledges, patents, applications, here in Brazil we have a big discussion regarding patent applications for uh, traditional knowledge of plants, plant-based traditional knowledge. But we did not touch on this issue specifically. Uh, but when I think, when you talk about fundamental rights, you can fit of course, uh, indigenous, the, the rights of indigenous populations, but also what I think is that the four, four, the four position papers have to be read as one talking with each other. And as Josie mentioned in her position paper, in the position paper of the working group for uh, the rights of indigenous populations, it can uh, be brought to the uh, position paper of the working group on user rights and as I mentioned also this is an ongoing discussion and the paper is not final we can review it and we can of course add uh, more specific more specifically the rights of indigenous populations to the working group yeah absolutely and I think it it goes to the overlap that we've identified in many of the issues that are tackled separately, but that um, actually converge on in many intersection points. Josie, did you want to add on to this um, from, from the perspective of your group? I know you mentioned it briefly, but would you like to complement? Well, I think, you know, uh, the, the kinds of issues of power rights are, are very much at the heart of the ethics paper. Um, and, and, you know, we're really interested in how use of licenses might be an abuse of those kinds of powers or infringe on people's rights or or be felt as disrespectful to people so um the it's very central to our paper especially in terms of uh, consent but obviously we really recognize that for uh, in many situations actually openly licensing things can itself be a very powerful positive thing to do not on every occasion um, and that's why um, we call within the paper for processes to make sure that you are aware of those issues and that you're reflecting on those and that you have challenge mechanisms built in. Um, and also, obviously, that you're proactively uh, reaching out to communities if there is going to be an impact on, on them of the work that you're sharing openly. Thank you. It's now time to address Jonathan's big question. I'm sure you've seen it all in the chat. And I think it's addressed to, to all of you. And I'll read it out. Um, and Jonathan wants to know if there's a general sense of optimism that the working group leads feel about being able to bring about beneficial change. It seems like so much of the copyright news, well, all news is bad these days, as if profit over people always wins. Do you feel the open community can effectively advocate for the values and specific steps you suggested in these working group papers? Who would like to take on Jonathan's question first? And actually, I would, yeah, I, I would also be interested in, you know, if you have any any ideas on how you um, 
you can engage in copyright advocacy. How, what would be the next step after the publication of these papers? But fire away, Josie. I'm, I'm really happy to answer this question first. And I feel a bit um, guilty because I think our group is best positioned to answer this positively. I think really what we're saying for the paper is that there is a huge opportunity for organisations to do social good and to increase benefits and opportunities for people by openly licensing their work and by making that decision. Um, we're not asking people to make that decision on the basis is that it should be a good thing to do. We're asking organisations to carefully consider the reasons that they're not opening things or the reasons that they might open things. So for our group, yes, it's hugely optimistic because there is a lot of opportunity there for organisations who don't currently openly license things to get involved, to contribute to the open ecosystem, to contribute to uh, using openly licensed assets to do good across the world and to make improvements. And we list some of the specific improvements that they might be able to contribute um, in the article. So for us, uh, this, this huge space is for wind. In terms of the kind of financial issues, particularly that you raised, Bridget, obviously uh, a lot of the kind of financial wrangling around open licenses depends on what you think the prize is. If you think the prize is a few more pounds for your organisation through selling some licensed works, then, you know, perhaps you'll be reticent to license works. But actually, if you think about it in terms of how digital economies work and you think about how services and added value wrappers exist around uh, digital assets nowadays, then, you know, there's huge prizes to be won by actually openly licensing things and by putting things in the open domain. That's what governments have recognised for a long time in terms of open government work, that, you know, you can put things into spaces to create new uh, industries, to create new markets, to uh, benefit people financially in, in far richer ways than you would do by just keeping things to yourself and by selling things in specific ways that, that you know, may actually be losing you money in some cases, in some well-known cases, actually not doing you very well as a, not a really, really great business models anyway. Um, so for our group, yeah, we're really, really positive. The fact that you can start to support some of the amazing work that's happened during, you know, that's been going on for years and years and years, but actually, you know, through Black Lives Matter and through other things that have been happening recently, have seen a popular resurgence and have become much more mainstream in terms of the conversations. The fact that you can help um, recognise and support those causes through open licences processes and practices is, is a huge win for everyone. So, yes, we're very, very positive on Team four. <laughs> Thank you. That's very inspiring. You really are the champion of the comments that they say you are. And would anyone else like to compliment or Jonathan, would you like to come on stage and maybe continue this conversation? Otherwise, Andre, Emine, Max, Max, mm -hmm. uh, Mahmoud, sorry. <laughs> That's all, Max, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, actually, um, I think, you know, again, sort of echoing, I think, some of what Josie was saying, I think, uh, with uh, the work of our group, um, I think it's we, we're sort of lucky in the sense that there seems to be a lot of alignment between a lot of different legislative, body, legislative bodies and the positions that uh, we're taking, especially around um, algorithmically generated content um, and, you know, the, the, the public domain. And, you know, the, the most recent one that I'm aware of is... Uh, when we submitted um, our response to the consultation from the UK Intellectual Property Office. And, um, you know, how, of course, we don't know how much of our particular input, they, uh, how much weighting it, it had, but, um, you know, their output, their, their conclusions were very much in line with what we put forward, um, which was quite encouraging. Um, and I think, but I think it also brings up um, an interesting um, thing for me, which is I think uh, some of the work that we're doing within the context of this working group, as well as I think other working groups, is to really highlight where copyright isn't the right framework to address some of these things. And I think in that sense, I think there is a lot of uh, work to do. And I think sort of recognizing where we need to keep working outside of the framework of copyright in order to be able to um, make sure that um, 
the people, the benefit is actually spread as widely as possible. And I think you know one one area, for example, specifically with regard to machine learning and TDM, for example, is that um, you know I, I would hate to see personally sort of a, 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 a trying to restrict access to information as a way to sort of regulate the the, the use of this information. Um, and rather really look at ways, again, out in, you know, this is not a copyright issue, but it is more of an equity issue in terms of access to the infrastructure needed to use the data. And, you know, one of the challenges we have um, from an ethical perspective, I, I think, um, as, a, as an open sharing community is that um, open sharing of data really strengthens the incumbents who have the technical infrastructure. Again, it's not about copyright law, but it's about they, you know, they have the engineers and the machines and the computers that are able to use this data. And um, it's more about really making sure that we are also doing the work that needs to be done in order to um, ensure that there's equi more equitable access to the infrastructure that's needed to use this information, not just to the legislative frameworks that are needed to, to, to protect it as well. Absolutely. It is a, it becomes a very practical question at the end, rather than a, a theoretical legal one. Andre? Yes. Well, I think we, there's reason to be optimistic, uh, Jonathan. As when we look past uh, when the main copyright laws in the world were passed in the 90s, like the DMCA in 98, here in Brazil, the copyright law is from, also from 98. We didn't have a Creative Commons, we didn't have a Wikimedia, we didn't have these civil society organizations which really defended the public interest, which really defended access to knowledge. And now we have these organizations. And I think this is reason to be hopeful, and this is the reason that our action matters. And uh, it's not going to be an easy battle, as you said. We don't have the means that like big companies may have, which we are here and we will keep on defending what we believe in. And something that comes to mind where, with your question is something that Loris Lysik said in the last CC summit. He said that 20 years is just the beginning. Uh, 20, 20 years is forever and 20 years is also just the beginning. So I think Creative Commons will keep on fighting this fight for more 20 years, 50 years, almost how long. And as long as we keep, keep fighting, I think there's reason to, reason to be hopeful. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, you all said a very important things. If, uh, so I would like to add a few more things. Um, I, I am also very hopeful, but I also believe that uh, sometimes uh, when we write policy recommendations and papers, we write them in very legal ways and we don't really explain them in layman terms. So I think we should also be able to explain uh, these things to uh, people like why it matters to uh, have freedom to share, why it matters to access the information, because uh, we should be able to explain why uh, sharing is important uh, to be able to exercise many fundamental rights. And this even includes freedom of thought, uh, which I'm also working on. So, for example, uh, Wikimedia, as Andrea mentioned, Wikipedia was blocked in Turkey for a while. And as I'm from Turkey, we were able to explain why it is important to unblock Wikipedia in Turkey, because people should be able to access information. But it takes time to explain things. Uh, but for example, Wikipedia is not blocked anymore. So sometimes things work, I guess. So yeah, that's what I think. Thank you so much. Um, I wish we could continue this conversation. I very much enjoy it and would love to take on more questions, but unfortunately we have to bring it to an end. So um, I want to seize this opportunity in closing to once again, thank uh, the leads, but also all the members. I know some of you were here. Hello, all members of the working groups. I know you're there and your work was also instrumental. So thank you so much for, for taking part in the, in the working groups and in this webinar. Um, I want also to uh, emphasize again that this is the end of the webinar, but it's not the end of the conversation. And like I mentioned, we will be communicating how you can engage in further steps uh, in, in further iterations of these groups and also how to take part in the copyright platform. Uh, if you'd like to, to join us, um, uh, we'll make sure to, to share that information. Um, so thank you very much uh, for joining us and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day.
Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.